Alexis. Thank you for joining us on the channel today. I am so excited to have you two five wing four Enneagrams in the same place at the same time. So excited. Thank you so much for having me. It is not often, you know, that we are able to meet one of, of our kind, right? I'm going to ask you the, the question that almost every Enneagram five will go, no, <laughs> which is, so tell us about yourself. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm Alexis Kingsley. Um, I have a YouTube channel uh, based around Myers Briggs and cognitive functions. Uh, the channel is just my name, Alexis Kingsley. Um, yeah, I'm an INTJ, five wing four. Um, yeah, I'm married, been married five years to an Enneagram nine. Yeah, so that's the gist. Well, congratulations on the five. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, oh, five, five and five. Seven. Five and five. Sorry. Well, and, and we will be coming up. I am a five wing four, also married to a five wing six, and we, we will be 23 years this year. Oh my gosh. So it's so interesting, two fives married. You know, I, that is actually a future video topic. I don't know if I'll ever get my husband on the channel. That's doubtable, but we will, but we will see. <laughs> Well, let's jump into like feelings and emotions. And that is something that the Enneagram five, um, you'll see even on the comments on some of the comments on my channel, which is more Enneagram specific, um, because that is where I have, you know, found my passion. So the detachments, um, how do you as a Enneagram five female, um, and, and what you see with the Myers-Briggs, I mean, what's your, what are your, what's your take on the emotions? Yeah. So for INTJs, our third cognitive function is introverted feeling. And that's really what relates to emotions. So any of the IJ personalities or the EP personalities um, are kind of balanced with thinking and feeling. Um, and to me, I think that's kind of where the four wing comes in. I draw a lot of commonalities with the introverted feeling function and the four wing. Um, and so theoretically with Myers-Briggs, when people are younger, like in their teens and 20s, they're over-reliant on that introverted feeling. And those inner feelings tend to be um, negative. For other personalities, it's more positive. It's like what you're passionate about and it tends to be more optimistic. But um, for INTJs, it's more negative. It's more like moping. I'm not in the, I'm not in the mood to be productive. Um, and it's more so around negative emotions. And so I would say depression is a very common thing that INTJs express. Depression, I mean, is any type could be depressed, but then there are certain factors that would cause INTJs to be depressed, you know, for different reasons, as opposed to other types. Um, so yeah, I think it's very interesting. Um, as far as like the Enneagram, I see a lot of correlations with Enneagram five and INTPs and INTJs mm -hmm. and INTPs are not very, um, emotional at all. So I could see there being kind of these two different subgroups and they may be more of the five wing sixes. Um, whereas INTJs when younger can actually be quite emotional. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there's a, one of my first videos and I'm going to do like a part two on it as well. It was, um, what it's like to be an Enneagram five female. And oh, there's yeah. been, it's, it's, it's a thing, right? Like that's a question I have later for you too, but. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned the different phases of life. I am not the person. I was in my 20s, you know, kind of thing. And then also looking at um, the younger, even younger than that, the if there's viewers or whatever that are Enneagram fives that are in um, their teens, um, I think that combination of teenhood and fives is it can be rough. I mean, don't, like we've both taught high school, right? You taught yeah. well, your high school? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah so, I've taught junior high and high school, yep. Yeah. So, and I've taught K through 12. So, I, but I my, started my career uh, grades six through 12 and that's already a hard year, you know, time anyway. But I think for the Enneagram fives, I think it can be especially rough, especially females. So there, that, that might be a future topic of videos. I think so, because I think like junior high is just a time where lots of people are trying to figure out where they fit in. And I think fives in general, just as a tendency, even mm -hmm. as adults probably have a hard time fitting in. So when you go through junior high, when all of a sudden, that's when all of a sudden like dating and things like that come to the forefront. And I think fives are like, I don't really know. I'm not really in my body at all. And now all of a sudden people are hyper interested in the way people's bodies look. And this is all of a sudden you get this language of like, this person's hot whereas you don't see that in elementary school. And so, yeah, I think that whole period of time is very uncomfortable because it feels like people start valuing things that are not your strengths. 
you have a fabulous video on energy management. Oh, thank you. That's how, that's how I actually, I think that was the first video when I was searching for like Enneagram fives and I saw your channel. That's how I found you was that. So if, if you could, um, and that's a big topic in a couple of different you know, forums that I have. Um, and I've also got a comment that I literally got, um, I think it was yesterday or day before. I'd like to read the comment and then I'd like to just discuss a little bit about energy management, um, because especially from a five perspective. Um, the quote goes, this was by JH on, our cha on my channel says, I constantly feel that everyone in my life is just taking, taking, taking. Every week and month, I feel my time and energy just slipping away into the void. I care about people, I really do, but I feel resentful that they always want so much. I often feel like there's nothing left for myself, like I can't be my own person and live my own life because of other people's interference and expectations. I honestly don't know how other people do it. I feel like it will destroy me. And I got to tell you, I really related to that. There's been periods in my life, um, especially after becoming a mom. But even before that, um, sometimes that energy management feeling like there's not enough of you to go around. And um, so if you could, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think I've related a lot to that. I remember especially, especially two years ago. Um, so I would teach eighth grade all day. And those are some high energy people. And I just found that to be very draining. Um, and then I would come home and especially at the time we were very involved. Um, we, so we lived with, we lived for a year, we lived with roommates. So there were seven of us living in a house. So I would go from like teaching eighth graders to living in this house with seven people. And at the time we had a lot of church events. So it was like, it was almost like every night we had some church event and I just couldn't handle it. I, I basically just mm -hmm. fell apart. Like after doing that for a very short amount of time, like after a month, I just like <laughs> all of a sudden became very like laying down the law. And I was like, we can do one thing after like outside of work, we can do one thing a week, or at least I can. And I won't do anything else besides that. And I think part of that was just, I had designed my life in a way that was not good for energy management. Like all my energy was being taken up mm -hmm. with work that I didn't enjoy. So then when I came home, there was absolutely no energy at all. Um, now, like during the summer, I feel like a completely different person. Like I feel like I have way more energy than I did during the school year. So you might want to, so like for this commenter, like you just might want to look into like, are there things that take up a significant amount of your time, like job, like a job that already just going to instantly deplete you. The other thing is whenever like with Myers-Briggs or with Enneagram, there's growth advice. And for the Enneagram, the growth advice is to go toward eight. And for like the INTJ, the growth advice is to be more like an ENTJ. I start hanging out with those people. So I now hang out mm -hmm. probably twice a week with an Enneagram eight. Um, and he is obsessed with like volleyball and spike ball and stuff like that. And so that's a way of, um, I'm kind of like learning from him. It's very uncomfortable and I, it's not natural and I can't do it all the time. And I don't necessarily feel like myself when I do it, but I think it's been really good for me. And I just try to look at people that have really high energy and what sorts of habits do they have in place? Like, um, in Myers-Briggs, it's like any of the SP types, but usually they're very good at drinking water and working out and moving their physical body. And they kind of understand that what you do with your physical body gives back energetically. And so I've just kind of tried to mimic them. Almost like having like an energy role model. Yeah. Yeah. Really? For sure. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Did you seek that out deliberately or did it just like kind of happen? Like I sought it out deliberately. I'm very, I'm very personal growth oriented. But I like what you said about, you know, what, what, what deliberate, and, and going back to your video, I mean, you know, I'm sure folks will check it out on our channel, right? Um, it was a great video, but really deciding what can go. I mean, for some people, the job can't go. The kids can't go <laughs> as much as as much as much I'd like a she, a she shed some days. <laughs> you know, it's just not happening. But what, what can? And I, I relate to the load, too. You know, just you got to go, okay, I, this is, I, there's too many things in my nights yeah. Yeah. And I would just look at, I think some people are a little static about what can and can't go. And I'm pretty liberal with it. Like 
like for me, I would say kids and spouse can't go. Uh, everything else can. Um, like even a job that you've had for 40 years, but that just comes down to like the experiences that I've had. And I'm just kind of <laughs> not willing to do things that are not in alignment. Even like if it's not going to work for me 10 years from now, I'm not going to give it another 10 minutes. And that's just being brutal. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much just being I mean, ruthless with cutting things out. Yeah. Because I just, yeah. yeah, I just don't like, I just don't like, um, sometimes like a victim mindset that people have They're like, well, this is kind of my lot and I can't change it. And sometimes it does take those moments, you know, those, those life change where you go, holy cow. Yeah. I've had, um, several friends in the past couple years younger than me in their early 40s that here today like you know one of my best friends was our bass player at church and I played with him every weekend and I played with him on a Sunday and he was gone on Monday he was 40 you know so you do take those kind of experiences and go okay So you kind of cover, let's cover extroverting more. Like you kind of covered it a little bit about should we extrovert more? And so this was a, um, I'm in a a group of several thousand fives. And this was a hot topic the other day, which was like, do we get better at extroverting? Do we just need to try harder? And then some people were like, well, this is just, no. Like, this is just a controversial topic. It is. Like, I had no idea. I found, I found on my channel, it's a controversial topic. Okay, for you too? <laughs> yeah, because that's one thing that I harp on about, but I'm willing to be polarizing on that topic. I've picked a few topics that I'm willing to die on that hill, and that's one of the topics I'm willing to die on. Okay, so um, tell me more. All right. So, okay, so one thing comes down to people have a misunderstanding of the definition of extrovert and introvert. Um, societally and in Myers-Briggs, the way Carl Jung uses it, are very different. So introvert means to turn inward and extrovert means to turn outward. Um, So it has nothing to do with the number of people you're around. So you could be in a room of 40 people and in that moment, you're just turning inward and reflecting. And then at another moment, you're talking to someone and turning outward and listening to what they're saying. Um, The way I describe it is that they're both needs, kind of like food and water are both needs. Like Um, The reason they're both needs is because they give you two different things and you may have a preference for a food over water, um, but at the end of the day, you need both. And I feel like introversion gives you depth. It gives you clarity. You reflect on your experiences and what they meant to you and you make meaning from things and get clarity and wisdom. And then when you turn externally, when you extrovert, that's when you get new information and that's when you can impact. So you kind of need a balance of input and output and input and output. So like, even when you read a book, that's turning externally. Um, So like, if you read a book, I think most people would consider that introverting. But when you think about it with these definitions, it's like you turn outward to what the author's saying, and then you turn inward and reflect. And so reading a book could be like um, a both introverted and extroverted activity. Um, I've found that in general at work, you should just really rely on your strengths um, because other employees are gonna manage your weaknesses. Um, like your strengths uh, or your weaknesses and other employees' strengths. So they'll kind of fill you in. Um, But at Mm -hmm. home, um, like if I'm a bad communicator or if I'm not a very kind communicator, there's not another employee that gets to run, you know, front of the shop. It's just like, it's just me and my husband. And like, if I communicate poorly to him, there's not another employee managing my weaknesses. Um, And so I feel like, especially in relationships, when no one else is going to pick up the slack, you really got to hone your weaknesses. Um, so I personally have found in my life when I am the most introverted, um, I have been quite unhealthy and I've been quite um, depressive. And if I were to look back on my life and if I had only introverted 100% of the time over 80 years, I wouldn't be content with my life or feel like I had had impact. Um, the same is true with extroverts. I think if people only extroverted 100% of the time, they wouldn't have the depth and the wisdom. Mm-hmm. And it's like introverts understand that it'd be bad to be 100% extroverted. And extroverts understand that it would be bad to be 100% introverted. But for some reason, like if you talk to an introvert and you're like, is it bad to be too introverted? They just don't get it sometimes. Um, so I think they're both very important. Like I think 
the more and more ambiverted I've become, the more healthy I feel like I am, the less misunderstood I feel. Um, yeah, I think people receive me better in general. The information I have is better received. Um, for a long time, I was so introverted and people wouldn't listen to my ideas and I would just blame it on other people. Like they just don't understand me. They're just not smart enough. And I would just be very blaming. Yeah, but yeah. when you spend time extroverting, um, it allows me to refine my ideas. And it's like, oh, there was this misunderstanding. I can communicate it better now here. And every time you just get better and better, I think, um, yeah, I think, yeah. So I, my opinion is that you should try to be as ambiverted as possible and that it's unhealthy to be on the extremes of the bell curve of introversion and extroversion. I love it. Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. That's a lot. Yeah. Of, that's my big philosophy. No, no. Like this is a big deal. Yeah. You know, I, I think some of that comes along with um, a maturity level. And this is not to say that one's immature. It just, it, we're different at 17 than we are at 47. I mean, it, that's obvious. Yeah. But, and I think, yeah, yeah, anecdotally, when I look at like junior hires, those are the most on the extremes people that I see. When I look at very, very introverted people, like I've had very extreme introverted students and very extreme extroverted students, because you're just kind of figuring out the balance. But when I look at people that are like 60, they seem a lot more balanced to me. And it's just kind of, it's just like a seasoning and maturity that happens. And yeah, you've got the depth and the clarity and then you can impact people with your wisdom and it's kind of a mutual, it's a well-roundedness. And you've got a function. Like, I think that's the biggest thing is someone will complain, well, I'm, you know, it's hard or this or that, but I don't want to like, and then they cross their arms and they don't want to talk to anybody. It's like, well, you're not communicating. <laughs> like, and you're going to have bad, if, like if you want to stick to the 100% introverted boat, I'll see you in 50 years and we'll see who's had a better life. But one quote that I really like, it's on the banner of my channel. Um, we are at once both works of art and artists working on ourselves. And there's like a tension between like, you have unique innate gifts that are great about you and you just stick to those things and be unique. And there's also this side where you have things about you um, <laughs> that are not healthy and could be healthier and you could stand to grow in for better relationships with people, for a better career and things like that. So it's kind of like a tension, like that introverted side of people that gives them a depth and a clarity and it's awesome. And I do not want people to stop going inward and reflecting, but if you do it too much, um, you're not getting enough input. And so the churning around in your introverted time starts becoming very um, like paranoid in nature. It becomes less and less grounded in reality and like less useful. So it's like, get the depth and the clarity and then output it so that it's of use to some people so that when you die, you'll yeah. be happy. Like th that knowledge has to mean something. Well, that goes to the Enneagram five, um, you know, avarice, right? Keeping, keeping what we have, that there's not enough, that we need to keep what we have, whether that's our time, whether that's our energy, whether that's our thoughts, whether that's our knowledge, you know, that we won't have enough. Yeah. I think, oh, one thing I didn't mention that I want to mention, there are also four types of extroverting, which I didn't mention. There are four different ways people turn outward, which if you, I have a video on my channel called the four types of extroverts. So um, that's another thing too. There are four types of ways you can extrovert. So when I say people should be ambiverts, that's different advice for different people. For some people, that's like, some people extrovert better at sporting events. Some people extrovert better at work. Some people extrovert better at social gatherings. So anyways, there are different ways and it's really important that you do your specific type of extroverting. Well, and reality is, I think that it's an extrovert world. Maybe I should say that differently. That's what seems to get communicated and that's what kind of gets responded to most often is what I've, I've seen. You know, there's got to be thinkers, but it's almost like a library that... You could have the biggest, the world's biggest library, but if nobody opens the doors and nobody ever goes in. Right, right. Then, like, you've got to, you've got to, like, to some extent, you have to advertise yourself, which sucks, but that's, yeah, people got to know your name before they're willing to listen to your ideas. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Oh, energy. That was a hot one. So the elephant in the room is how did two fives 
especially five wing four females end up on YouTube. So I am curious to hear your story. Oh yeah, this is, this is one of those kind of like smack you in the face sort of things that I probably wouldn't have ever gotten around to it, except, um, the summer of 2019, uh, or I guess the spring of 2019, I found a breast lump and I like super young. So I'd go to an appointment and they would say like, oh, you're super young. Don't worry about it. And then they would feel it. And it was pretty sizable. And then they'd be like, oh, actually that's pretty big. And I had anyway, several series of appointments. It took them six months to figure it out. Um, and it turned out to be nothing, but it really woke me up to say, um, I always kind of had this plan of like, first I'll teach junior high, then I'll teach high school, then I'll teach college. And I kind of had these steps in my life of what I wanted to do. And it kind of woke me up to say, I might not have 83 years that I've been, you know, kind of banking on the average. Um, so I should maybe just get to it. If teaching junior high is not my thing, maybe I shouldn't do it. And I started, um, it, it made me just open up that I don't have to live within the mold of uh, going to school, going to college, having one of the standard careers. It really woke me up to say like, if this was the end of my life, I wouldn't be happy with the way that I lived it. And so I think it's that experience that really woke me up. So after I found out it was all good, probably a month later, I filmed my first YouTube video and it's a very embarrassing video. It's still on my channel if you want to check it out, but it's me analyzing micro and ma macro fashion trends. <laughs> which is a very, I was, I guess, maybe the little four coming out where it's like, I'm really going to get out of the mold. But after doing two videos on the topic of fashion, I had pretty much exhausted my interest. And so <laughs> I ended up stopping. And then I, I kind of gave it up. The school year started um, and then COVID happened. And so then in March, when school got out and I had more time, I decided to pick it up again. And that's when I kind of experimented with business topics and Myers-Briggs was the topic that really stuck. That's the topic that I have the most knowledge in and happened to be the topic that got the most views. And so kind of like grateful for that experience that I had. It was a really stressful six months thinking that I blew it out of proportion, but it was good. So really just a, a passion for knowing that you had, you had more to contribute. Really? Yeah, yeah, really. And I think it was, you know, I had been giving, you know, as a math teacher, I guess I had been kind of giving math knowledge and I really enjoy math as a hobby, but I think I realized that I wanted to do something that had a little bit more impact. Um, and I always found math was a fun hobby, but um, for me personally, and like the gifts um, that I have, I felt like I wanted to leave a mark on the world that was different than math education. And so I felt like personal growth um, is something that I'm very passionate now because of that. I love it. Wow, I did not know that about you. And I've watched, I've like binge, binge watched your channel. So. <laughs> yeah, the personal stories don't make it in as often. As they imagine that, you know, <laughs> with, with a five. I can't imagine. <laughs> That's, That's funny. funny. Give a like if you like this video, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.